Hi guys, welcome to this first presentation on sport and exercise psychology, and this is for the A2 specification for psychology. Arousal and anxiety, biological. Performing requires us to be physically and mentally prepared. Physiologically, this means being at the state of arousal that will enable us to do the task at hand. Arousal is a physiological state, and it increases when the environment makes demands on us to do something. Our bodily responses to increased levels of arousal include increased heart rate and increased respiration rate. Increased arousal prepares us for our most basic response to stress, fight or flight. In terms of sport, researchers have tried to assess how much arousal we need in order to perform, and to outline the optimal level, optimum level of arousal for sports performance. Anxiety is linked to arousal and is defined as a negative emotional state of apprehension that we experience when we perceive that a situation is threatening to us, for example, exam anxiety. Anxiety impairs perform performance, and so it is necessary for athletes to minimise their anxiety so that they can perform well. Arousal and performance. The first theory that tried to explain the re relationship between arousal and performance was presented in 1908 and is based on the yerkes dodson law. This predicts the relationship between levels of arousal and performance. This theory is known as the in 32 hypothesis. In this model, arousal increases up to the, up to the optimal point which is just at the top here, but too much arousal will lead to a drop in performance, as you can see by this graph. The model suggests that easy tasks are best performed when drive is high, and complex tasks are best performed when drive is low. However, this model doesn't account for individual differences in performance, or the fact that different types of skill require different levels of arousal to achieve optimal performance. In 1980, Oxendine extended the model to take uh, these factors into account. Oxendine's research led him to suggest that the inverted U theory should be extended to include the following generalizations. 1. A high level of arousal is necessary for optimal performance in gross motor activities involving strength, endurance and speed. 2. A high level of arousal interferes with, with performance involving complex skills, fine muscle movements, coordination and concentration. 3. A slightly above average level of arousal is preferable to a normal or below average level of arousal for all motor tasks. Oxendine's support for these propo proposals is based largely on anecdotal evidence. There are problems when applying Ox Oxendine's theory to real sports settings uh, as the theory does not define what complex and simple means in terms of the tasks, nor what constitutes high, normal and above average arousal levels. Oxendine suggested that there was evidence for the yerkes dodson law in a sporting context but the optimal level of performance would be dif at different points on the arousal axis with sports that involve motor skills, strength, endurance and speed having a high level of optimal arousal and sports involving fine motor skills, coordination and concentration needing a lower level of arousal for optimal performance. Oxendine suggested different levels of optimal arousal are needed for different sports skills as follows. For um, extreme arousal, um, this would be for sports skills such as American football tackling, weightlifting, and etc. Uh, for four on the arousal level scale, this would include long jump, running, swimming, races, etc. For three, basketball skills, boxing, and high jump, etc. Two, fencing, tennis, baseball. Uh, one, which is slight arousal, archery, bowling, golf putting, and zero, um, basically no sports. Okay. Um, both the inverted U hypothesis and Oxendine's version of it present difficulties as the variables of arousal and performance are difficult to objectively measure. However, they can be considered useful as they describe the effect of arousal on the performance of different skills in various sporting contexts. Spielberger, uh, 1966, differentiated between trait and state anxiety. Trait anxiety. This refers to a person's general personality or disposition to be anxious. State anxiety, this refers to a person's level of anxiety experienced in a specific situation, e.g. when competing. State anxiety is further subdivided into somatic state anxiety, which refers to the person's physiological state at that time, which is having a negative effect on their performance, such as feeling nauseous, breathing heavily, or having your heart pounding. Cognitive state anxiety, and this refers to a person's negative thoughts and cognitive processes that are impeding their performance, such as lack of self-confidence and doubting whether they can do what is needed to perform well, fear of losing, or evaluation apprehension. Measuring anxiety. It is useful to be able to distinguish between a normal arousal reaction and a high anxiety reaction. Rainer Martins developed two scales to measure anxiety. The sport uh, competition anxiety test, the SCAT test, 
and the Competitive State Anxiety Inventory, which is abbreviated to um, the CSAI2 test. The SCAT test, this scale measures trait anxiety. It was designed to have a, an unambiguous procedure so that the respondents would be clear on what they had to do, would reduce the likelihood of response bias, and would be easy to score. The test comprised of 15 items and was a pen and paper test. For each of the items, the respondent had to select whether the item was true for them, rarely, sometimes, or often. The test categorised respondents as low, average, or high in trait anxiety. 10 items out of the 15 items were used to create a trait anxiety score out of 30. Martin showed the test was reliable, with R um, equaling 0.77. For the CSAI2 test, um, Martin et al. presented a multi-dimensional model of sports state anxiety where somatic anxiety had a U-shaped relationship with performance, self-confidence had a positive linear relationship with performance, cognitive state anxiety had a negative linear relationship with performance. This model led to the development of the CSAI2 test, which was designed as a measure of state anxiety. It is a pen and paper test comprising of 27 items, 9 of which measures somatic anxiety, 9 measure cognitive state anxiety, and the other 9 measure self-confidence. Three scores on a scale of 9 lowest to 36 highest are obtained, giving separate measures of the three variables. The procedure for the test comprises of getting a baseline measure 48 hours before competition, then 24 hours before, then 2 hours be before, and finally 5 minutes before the competition. This is referred to as the time to event paradigm. The results show that cognitive anxiety decreases steadily in the run up to the event, but increases rapidly just before the event, while somatic anxiety rises steadily up to the event and peaks just before the event. Optimizing and controlling anxiety. It is important for athletes to be aware of the possible effects of arousal and anxiety on their ability to perform. It's also important that they practice and implement strategies that will help them to optimize their arousal and manage their anxiety. And this is the end of this presentation. I hope you made some notes as uh, you went along. And I'll be making some more videos on sports psychology, so make sure you check those out. Thank you.